Okay. okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys, Cord Electronics Professional here. Um, I'm here with Mike Hyam, actually in Abbey Road. We're doing some questions with Mike. Here we go. So Mike. Tom. Lovely to meet you. Um, Thank you, you too. For anyone that doesn't know who you are. Yes. Um, which should be a very short list if you ask me. Oh, I don't know about um, that. <laughs> can you tell us a bit about who you are and what you do? I'm Mike Hyam. I am a music supervisor and producer and composer. God, I sound like a real know-it-all. <laughs> um, and I work on feature films. They're not small feature films though, are they? No, yeah. I've worked on some quite big ones, yes, over the can time. You, can you name a few? Yes. Uh, what are you most proud of, let's say? Okay, okay. Uh, well, working backwards, because yeah. uh, my memory's not great. <laughs> uh, I'm just literally just finishing The Little Mermaid for Disney, which uh, is definitely up there in one of the proudest things because it's been a huge, huge uh, effort uh, from everybody because it's been such a long time because of the, the pandemic. Um, we managed to keep filming during the pandemic. Uh, so yes, Little Mermaid uh, going backwards from there um, into the woods, uh, Stephen Sondheim. And also I think the most fun I had and the one I'm most proud about how it turned out was Sweeney Todd, mm. uh, the Tim Burton film, because I love Stephen Sondheim. And the idea that Tim had never made a musical before, uh, and also I just love the story. It was a fantastic film, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Yeah. It I mean, brilliant. the whole story about somebody getting, you know, people getting killed in a barber's chair and then ending up in a meat pie, it's quite gruesome. It's gruesome. Yeah. It's who so better to, to do it than Tim Burton? And so he, was, he was like a kid in a sweet shop. <laughs> and in fact, I can tell you a funny story, uh, working with Stephen Sondheim, who, God rest his soul, one of the most collaborative people, he was so generous with our take, mine and Tim's on the musical take, that Stephen was there for all the pre-records and then sort of said, do your thing. Oh, and so God. we were able to sort of, through Tim's vision, uh, and I was there to obviously support that, we could actually come up with, with different ideas for, for the score. And, uh, and I ended up adapting all of Stephen Sondheim's music and I created the underscore as well, which oh, just, came naturally because Tim looked at the film as sort of like an opera and he just didn't want the music to end. Uh, but at the beginning of that, for anybody who knows Sweeney Todd, uh, when it played on Broadway or in the West End, there was a huge organ sort of prelude to the piece. And Steve Sondheim, I'll never forget, he'd never heard it played on a proper church organ. And one of my big things was to think wow wouldn't it be great for the film if we could get this recorded with a real organ and that's quite hard having called around a few huge cathedrals in uh, the uk uh, where i could thought can we come and record you uh, you know they were like well what's the subject matter it's quite hard going to sort of a, a religious institute and talking about sweeney todd Anyway, a very dear friend of mine, a guy called Andy Richards, who uh, is an amazing keyboard player. He was uh, who I met when I worked for Trevor Horn, and he was a big part of uh, Frankie O's Hollywood. And Andy actually went to rugby school up in rugby, and he was an organ scholar up there. And they have their own chapel on the in the boarding school. And uh, Andy hadn't been back there for, oh God, well over 25 years. And he called up the school as a sort of alumni and said, uh, could I come and record the organ? And we went there and we recorded the opening. And I remember saying to Tim, Tim, we found somewhere to record this organ. And it's like a couple of hours outside of London. And Tim Burton's a busy man. And I remember him opening the, the doors of the church, the chapel and walking up the aisle. And I got Andy to play some sort of real Dr. Fibes. Big, and I was seeing him <laughs> smirk. But then we played the, the actual piece to Steve Sondheim and he, couldn't believe how good it sounded and just sort of going to that nth degree of trying to record the real thing because you can't substitute a real pipe organ Absolutely. is just amazing it's phenomenal isn't it? it's the feeling as well of, of the yeah presence of it the was incredible it was incredible so doing things getting to play with other people's ideas and, and adapting them and Sweeney was 22 months and getting to work with people like Alan Rickman Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter 
Oh, it was amazing. 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 And they were all really terrified <laughs> because they didn't, they're amazing actors, but they would themselves would say they're not singers. Mm -hmm. So just going into the studio with them and just trying to get the best out of them and trying to make it as relaxed as possible, that was really re rewarding mm -hmm. because I think that it was far more important that they were amazing actors than they were amazing singers. Mm -hmm. And uh, people seem to like the film. For, for my own personal interest then, coming, coming from uh, a different point of view, did you get a vocal coach in with them in the studio? When no. Did that filming, no, they just... no, I do. I can do uh, a bit of vocal work, but okay. um, in my experience, getting them to be as relaxed as they can. Mm -hmm. And I purposely went to a small studio. We went to Eden Studios in West London and it was very small, bit funky rock and roll. It wasn't like they were standing with the sort of glass screen looking like a goldfish, you know, <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. getting red, li red light syndrome. Yeah. And um, no, they were they just that's that's them. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. What an experience. Yeah. It was amazing. An experience. Amazing. 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 And Johnny Depp and Alan Rickman never met. So for their duet in uh, in uh, Pretty Woman, they never met. So the first time they met were, were when they were on uh, on the set singing the song together. Uh, yeah. It was it was amazing. And it was the first huge musical that I'd done. Uh, and and Tim had never done it, but he loved the music. And as I say, Stephen Sondheim was just so generous gave us such a long leash yeah. you know to yeah. just do stuff and uh yeah so that's something i'm proud of but i have to say little mermaid is very special and it's coming out in a couple of months and uh yeah that's getting to work with alan menken and rob marshall again is pretty pretty good yeah amazing wonderful leads well into the next question actually um, on. it does say you've got an incredible body of work behind you yeah and nominated for yeah um and won awards for yes um so how long have you been in the industry and how did you get your first break? Okay, I'll, I'll try and keep this as short as possible. Uh, no, make it as long as you like. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I, went, I went to Darton's College of Arts uh, when I left school uh, to go and study music. And then from Dartington, I went to the Guildhall and carried on uh, studying music. What was it that you specifically studied? You uh, piano okay. and composition. Mm -hmm. And I sort of as a kid that grew up in the 80s I loved Trevor Horn's work and I thought oh my god I'd just love to go and work for this guy because I realized you know we sort of get to 18 19 what am I going to do to earn a living I've got to do something you it's know a scary thought, isn't it? it's a scary thought you've suddenly got to be grown up but all I all my life was music I just love music and making music and so uh, good old-fashioned day back in it was probably 1990 I penned a letter I wrote a letter <laughs> and uh, posted it Amazing. in a post box <laughs> and uh, uh, miraculously and I'll and I'll never know how this happened I got a phone call the next day from Trevor's PA uh, Trevor was looking for a technical assistant and I went for an interview to Psalm Studios in Basing Street mm -hmm. and I remember um, Trevor was uh, late coming into the building and I remember sitting in the reception and he went he was sat upstairs in Studio 4 and I was sat at the back of the room and Trevor was doing something on the computer and uh, he had a problem and he was on the phone to one of these helplines and I knew what he wanted to do mm. and I'd used the piece of software Amazing. and I thought, oh my God, shall I say something? So I did and I said, excuse me and I'll never get Trevor looking around at me. I said, if you go to this menu and go here, I think that will do what you wanted to do and I never went home. Mm. And I basically got hired and Trevor's such a great guy. I became his technical assistant and then he found out I could, was a musician and I ended up playing on some records and uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild That's ride. Crazy, isn't it? <laughs> and um, yeah, I worked with Trevor from then till about 1997 and uh, spent a lot of time in America working on stuff. and. I, that's how I got it and Trevor taught me everything I know today about production, about it not just being about the music but also being a people skills and, and almost like being a politician and that has stead me so good through life in realising that it's not, you know, how you get the best performance out of somebody when you're mm -hmm. recording is, is so much harder than you think it is <laughs> and it's knowing when not to speak, mm -hmm. that's one thing I've learned is don't say anything because you need to interact with that person and see, do they want you to say, oh, that was good, or the classic thing, should we get another one? Mm -hmm. It's not always about that. It's actually about, don't say anything and let them just pick it up and do what they want. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how I 
that's how I got into the business. I wrote a letter. Uh, and nowadays, of course, you'd probably send an email. Yeah. But for people who don't know who Trevor Horn is, it was a bit like if you wanted to get into politics, it was like writing to the prime minister. Back in the early <laughs> 90s, you know, it was, yeah, it's amazing. He was the man, wasn't he, really? Yeah, he so. pioneered the sound of the 80s and, and he continues to work now and he's such an amazing musician and i think people think that he's a guy who is very much obsessed with the technology but one thing that amazed me as being a musician is that he would pair a song back and just play it on a, an acoustic guitar and work out how can this chord be better or can we structure the song better before he even went to all the the toy box and started playing he'd get the foundations right and that okay. taught me a lot about get the the crux of something correct before you start building upon it. It's like, you know, lay the foundations properly yeah, yeah, yeah. before you start adding all the bells and whistles because the bells and whistles don't mean anything unless you've got a real foundation. foundation. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, really, I know that sounds so obvious and simple, but really that is the case. It's an important factor. Yeah, it really is. And the, all the sonics and all the equipment sort of comes second best to that, you know, and even now I'd rather listen to a great song not recorded so well mm. than listen to an okay song that's yeah. been recorded amazingly you know because it's about it's about the music isn't it it's about the, it the, really the, is the, always the emotional uh, it connection yeah absolutely. it's all about it's all about how you uh, understand that and 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 what that does for you because you know nine out of ten people aren't going to care whether it was recorded on the most amazing microphone mm. it's like where's the chorus any good can i sing it you know and he taught me that but of course if you can combine that with them making a sublime recording and making it as good as you physically can then then you've got something i think mm. super special hit the nail on the head with that one jeez <laughs> <laughs> um well that i mean that kind of again that's led into and probably talked about it a little bit already um would say what would you say that some of your career highlights have been oh boy uh i can tell you one that just talking about trevor uh i we were working on a tina turner album and Tina Turner was flown in from Switzerland. She'd come and sung a song four times. And these are the days when we were just starting to use Pro Tools where you could comp in a computer because we were used to doing it on tape. And I'll never forget, she sang the song four times down in, uh, Trevor lived in St. John's Wood and, uh, <laughs> it's a bit detailed information there, but uh, lives in St. John's Wood and he had a studio down in the basement. We were working at his house and she came down and she sang this song four times. Each take was just sublime, insane. And it was about 10 o'clock at night and she was going back off to Switzerland. And as she was leaving, just very casually, we're seeing her out. She said, you know, it'd be really nice if we had like a guest male vocalist for the, for the end choruses. See, you know, see what you think about this. And um, came back in the studio, by which time it's about probably 10.30. Trevor's on the phone and I could hear him talking and he walked in and he said, uh, we need to, we're going to record something now. And I used to, when uh, sort of four years into my time with Trevor, uh, I ended up recording stuff and sort of learned how to be an, a sort of engineer. I certainly wouldn't class myself as being an engineer of Abbey Road quality, but I could certainly get by and record what you needed to record. And uh, it was about 11 o'clock. Uh, in the evening. Yes, Le about 11 o'clock. Uh, Trevor had gone up to see his wife upstairs and came back down and said, Mike, uh, Sting's coming in at 11 to come and do some vocals. And I went, right, okay. <laughs> and uh, so Sting turns up, uh, listened to the track a couple of times and sang some ad lib stuff on the end of these choruses of this song. Incredible. And it was incredible because A, he was so great and didn't moan about the headphone balance or anything like that and just recorded. He recorded maybe five times and I'll never forget he walking behind me and I'm in front of Pro Tools and he's like, I like the yellow one. I like the green one because he was seeing the, the coloured tracks and he could see because we were starting to put it together because he wanted to be part of that. And we were building the sort of best comp with him in the room. And I was thinking, oh my God, I'm sat in front of a computer here that back then wasn't that stable and we were recording into it and doing all this stuff and Sting sat behind me going yeah the yellow one's cool and Trevor was like great and by the time I left work that night which was probably about 1 30 in the morning we'd recorded Tina Turner and Sting had sung some ad-lib things on the end of the chorus so it's like 
that was pretty good and I'm sort of 25 years old and that definitely goes down as a career highlight. That was a mad time. That is a highlight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one's going to be an interesting one. Okay. Um, okay. For myself and uh, probably people that would be viewing this as well. Um, but there's always an unknown about how films are produced and soundtracks are produced. And, okay. And how one goes about doing filming a uh, recording a, a soundtrack yeah. and then going actually it needs this it needs this like, like you mentioned previously yeah so what does a typical day look like to you and then how would you go about your day-to-day -day yeah. job and yeah. then how you would go about in basic steps doing a soundtrack from day one oh boy okay to um the end I think a, a, a film soundtrack, I think the first thing uh, is when you're working with the actor, uh, you need to uh, understand what their capabilities are vocally. So if you've got the demo of a song, sit at a piano, work out a very good key that's going to work for them. So it's not too high, so, so you, not so too low. The piece is written in a, in a key, I assume, but then you would adjust that? We'd adjust it, go down that. in steps. Okay. Go down in steps or go up in steps to find the sweet spot because everybody's got a sweet spot in their vocal range. And, um, well, unless you're somebody like Ariana de Grande who can sing <laughs> incredible, you know, like, I mean, there are vocalists, of course, who can sing crazy, have a crazy range, but, you know, most actors will just find that there'll, there'll be a sweet spot where they sing. So you adjust the key of the song, uh, get that on the piano, and then record it as a guide vocal. And then from there, I make a demo of the song, and then still using that guide vocal because you've sort of worked out a tempo and a flow. But working with Rob Marshall, what's fantastic about working with Rob is always thinking about the final piece. So whether there's any choreography in the piece, if there's any storytelling in the piece that needs to be like within say a, an instrumental section where there's going to be dialogue, working out the structure of the song to accommodate the story okay. is a huge part. So you might go, we need eight bars of instrumental music now between the verse and the chorus or the verse and the bridge. So we need to work on working out what that is. Okay to try and create a hole for the dialogue. Yeah. And then once you've worked out the structure of the song, then create the demo of all of that. And then it would get orchestrated. Okay, so just, just very quickly. Uh, and that, then that, that I've preceded something down that takes a month, by the yeah, way, into, yeah, course, into two minutes. Yeah, no, yeah. But I'm, I'm, my question is um, that instrumental eight bars, for example, yeah. would, could, would that be, and could that be on the fly expanded yes, and contracted. Yes, very much so. It and could end up being an eight, eight, eight bar idea. It could end up being a 16 bar idea that comes to 12 bars, that comes to eight. So sometimes actually we only need four because the dialogue can be read. And Rob would sit there sometimes with the script and he'd play the actor's part if I'm working on the song. Okay. So there'd be time where just me and him are working together on the length of the, the breaks. Mm. And then we'd audition it on the floor in a rehearsal space, which is amazing. So you could actually work out, because when people sort of get up on their feet and start to act, anything can happen. Yeah. So you go, actually, you need more time. So we'd probably double it, the eight bars, and make it 16 for the, for the audition process, on the rehearsal process, sorry. And then we'd probably cut it back down as everybody gets into the groove and you need to work out the, the timing. So it would go large and small, large and small. And, and that's why having it all in MIDI, we'd have it in MIDI so it's running virtual and I'd have it on a laptop or something. And we can just play that back so people are singing to the same tempo all the time and getting to, rather than sitting with a piano all the time because that's, you can move around. So basically that that's what that process would be and then we talk about the sort of colors of the song or on this on little mermaid for example we talked to alan uh and alan's just such a sweetheart and he's just like again it's rob's vision it's mike you do what you want to do with this and then play it to me and we'll listen and talk about it and that's pretty amazing when you somebody like alan menken so uh, once you've got that ready, we'd go into a studio with the musicians and we'd record it. And then uh, we'd, I'd always have the actor come along, if they can, to the studio mm -hmm. with the orchestra because then they can really own it. And then don't do it to a click so it can be a real performance. Yeah. 
especially if you're not working to picture. So if it's a pre-record because the picture hasn't been shot and then let the actor really perform it and the orchestra would follow the tempo, which is, I think makes for such a great performance. Yes, that will absolutely. I mean, I guess having the orchestra or, or the, the musicians in house yeah. with the actor, yeah. it's not only the, the, the actors going, this is cool because I've got a, a band behind me, but the, the musicians are going, well, this is cool because the actor's here as well. And When we were doing uh, Little Mermaid, I remember Melissa McCarthy, who plays Ursula, when she went out into the room, she, she actually went out into the room with the orchestra and she was terrified, of course. <laughs> but it was so great because the, the, it's the connection that you've got all those incredible world-class musicians and they understand there's not the glass screen bet between us so we become one trying to we're all trying to make this thing let's all try and do it together you know and um i so i'm a big believer in trying to involve everybody uh on the on the ground level so it's not very much me and them yeah. it's like this is a team effort we're all trying to get to the best we can so we're trying to just break down barriers and for melissa being able to stand two feet from John Mills, our lead violinist, was just like listening to this orchestra. She was blown away, but it, it pays dividends because she can own the song that way. Amazing, mm. amazing. So, so taking it back a step, the, just for, for those that may or may not know, the soundtrack is recorded before any of the screen work is... Yeah, is so done. we do what we call pre-records. So uh, we record 10, 12, 15, 20 songs, mm -hmm. and we will have rehearsed with the process that I've just talked about with mock-ups and we will have rehearsed that so everybody understands the structure more importantly the tempo that we felt because it's really hard in the heat of the moment when you're filming sometimes everybody wants to do this faster or you find out wait this is too slow because there's a sort of rhythm that sets up with dialogue mm -hmm. and then Rob is so brilliant at working out as you're speaking like going into a song it should feel completely seamless you don't want to feel like, oh, here's the needle drop. You know, it should be like you're going from from speech to singing. And it just should just feel natural. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the that's the sort of roadmap of, of what happens. OK, well, that, that was very interesting, to be honest with you, because it's not, it's not, not something that I personally know anything about. At yeah, all. yeah. Um, and of course, and when you when you film the scene, if you find that actually we needed to we needed longer in the heat of the moment because when you're when you're shooting like we, you never want to tie yourself down mm. so we still use those pre-records not as absolute your flag in the sand there's still flexibility like oh actually we we want another four bars in the chorus so we'd sort of do a, like a frankenstein edit on the day yeah. and then we'd re-record it massage it or whatever so it's an ever evolving process mm. but having the pre-records done with an orchestra before you go in and film is such a great way of doing it because everything sounds so good mm -hmm. and it inspires everybody i think to just be as good as they can yeah. be lifts up the actors uh, yeah you know, i think so even though yeah. mock-ups and midi mock-ups are so good these days you you'll you'll never beat a live symphony orchestra and having that feeling and that performance and especially when they've been part of the process they rely. They they sort of relate. Sorry to to what's happened, and I think there's some magic that happens in that. And to carrying that through the shooting process, they kind of feel like they've owned that moment, and they just bring their A game. Mm. Uh, Amazing. Yeah, it's it is a fascinating thing because most actors I've worked with who are not singers are generally terrified of singing. I mean, most people are, if you're not yeah. a singer, yeah. <laughs> standing in front of 200 crew, uh, because whether you're singing live or whether you're lip syncing, it's still terrifying. And I'm a big advocator of getting live versions as well. So we'd mute the, we'd always take stems to the shoot. So stems being, you know, uh, mm -hmm. instrumental sections of the, uh, of the song, bass, drums, guitars, strings, woodwinds. Uh, we could mute the vocal and then the actor's free to then sing live. And I'd always do that on every take. Mm -hmm. So we've got an option because some magic happens, you know. Sometimes the actual film Hearing them, yeah. and, and being Ab there and how it is, is, you know, transformation. Yeah, it is. That's transformation all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's English, right? <laughs> um, okay, so what are your biggest challenges with music editing and the production of it? Gosh. 
The biggest challenge is that if you want to keep an integrity of a piece of music, but it needs to fit a picture that is not particularly musically uh, fitting with what you want, that's the biggest challenge. That's the answer. There is no, you've got to basically try and make something work to the picture. And whether that, you know, if you've got, if it's a song and you've got an eight bar chorus and you have to make it a six bar chorus, people are expecting, they don't know why, but why does it sound weird? Because there's two bars that aren't there anymore because you've got to fit the scene. But I've been very lucky when you're working with picture editors that understand the musicality of it and you can explain to them why it feels odd, that they'll hopefully adapt the picture as well or we'll re-record the piece to try and make the music edit work. But music editing, you sort of have your hands tied when you're working on, especially musicals, because you've, you're fixed to sync. Yeah. Um, so the challenges of that are trying to make something feel musical, trying to make something feel as if it hasn't been edited that's the secret, I think, is just to make the, e the, the edit feel invisible because then nobody will know it's an edit. Uh, well, I yeah. think the, the challenges of production <laughs> could be its own podcast. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> there are so many challenges to production. I mean, literally on my last project, The Little Mermaid, one of the challenges of the production of that were we had a world pandemic. So... I had just a, never just a small problem. <laughs> just a small problem. So we had to. We wanted to keep working. Uh, we had to work remotely. But I'd never recorded anybody remotely ever. Even since you know companies like Source Connect made that a possibility, I'd always wanted to be in the room with the artist. So I had to learn how to do that. And it's really weird because you've got all kinds of delays on Zoom. You've got, you know, there's you haven't got that one-on-one -on -one feeling, and you lose that sort of personal people interaction thing mm -hmm. that was a massive challenge and it was a massive challenge to also um myself and andrew dubman carried on mixing the um the pre-records because the day we finished the vocal pre-records at british grove the world shut down which was in march 2020 and we basically had all this material that needed mixing and that was our next stage and we, we couldn't do it. So Andrew worked remotely, I worked remotely, and then I learned all about Zoom and audio movers and things like that. And so that challenge of the pandemic, that was, that was a huge sort of 2022 challenge, if you like, 2020 yeah. to 22 challenge. But other challenges on production, I suffer massively from imposter syndrome. <laughs> and I think when you go into the studio with an amazing musician, you want them to feel secure and you want them to feel like they that you know what you're doing as well and i think i do know what i'm doing but you do in your mind you feel that you've got imposter syndrome and i think one thing that's really hard for production getting studios is always a, a difficult thing that i think gets left out because you know you've got to find the right place to record what you need to record you want a small place to record you know a small ensemble and you need a big you know it's it's just common sense but the UK is blessed because it's so busy uh, with recording and filmmaking here. Uh, getting the time in studios now is becoming a harder thing, which is it actually makes me really happy because it means all my buddies and colleagues are all working and it's mm. busy. But it is a challenge to actually get to the final deadline because everybody wants everything done. Yeah, within a deadline. That's with, within thing, a right? deadline, yeah. and that's a that's a challenge. But musical challenges with with production i mean they're infinite they're infinite tom i mean you, you know microphones breaking down mm. uh talk back not working properly that's a really tricky thing with production and just making sure that any artist just feels like they're at home in the studio yeah <laughs> uh so that that goes on to the question do you get time to play music at home uh, i uh yes i do but uh and, and it's ridiculous i'm 53 next month and I've never had a really nice setup in my house to have to, to sit down and listen to a piece of music in the way that it does. Because whether you're working at Air Studios, Abbey Road Studios, you're working any world class studio, you're so spoiled with however the audio sounds like. You're never going to get it as good at home. But even even still, when I'm at home, of course, I want to be able to sit down. I don't want to sit down after I've been working on music all day, but when I do, when I'm not, I want to sit down. Yeah. And I have just bought 
some Bowers & Wilkins 700 series speakers. And uh, I'm just about to purchase some cord electronic amp of some description. Oh, there we go. And uh, <laughs> because I think the combination of those two is uh, is pretty sweet. It's very special, isn't it? It's the reason it's been used across across the board as a as a standard, isn't it? And it's a standard, yeah. And and I think that and and my source will will be vinyl because I love vinyl and I love the cracks and I love but I can put up with all of that because I still think it sounds fabulous. We have a token name for that at cord electronics. Here's crackle pop. <laughs> I'll put up with it. I'll put up with the hiss crackle pop because the just the dynamic range you get from from vinyl is I haven't heard anything that sounds as good yet. And so that sounds like a challenge. Yeah. Well, that's another conversation. <laughs> that another conversation. But seriously, <laughs> being able to have that signal path mm. from the vinyl to the preamp to the speakers. Yeah, yeah it'd be pretty special and I'll be able to sit down there and just wallow and listen to lovely music yeah what's your what is your, okay so this is this is, is something else that's not in here but what would yeah. you classify as your favorite music is uh, it that you've worked on is no it stuff that no I will very rarely listen to anything that I've worked on at home I I'm love sitting down I love singer songwriters a uh, Canadian singer called Sarah McLaughlin I love Sarah McLaughlin's work um I very famous in the hi-fi industry. Yeah, so, I, 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 yeah, voice. yeah. I, I love that. I love a load. I love Motown. I love listening to Motown. I love jazz. I love the Sex Pistols. So I've got. I honestly, I do have that really weird eclectic taste, and I love that idea. And um, I know I was working at the Penthouse uh, doing the Atmos mix for Mermaid, and we were listening to some spatial audio music just to sort of get us in a vibe to see like, wow, what are other people doing before we did the Atmos mix? And I was listening to some Skrillex. <laughs> and uh, I'd heard my son, who's 24, uh, who's called Tom, and, uh, and not me. Dad said, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not that old. And, and he said, uh, dad have you checked out Skrillex I was like no uh, but I did and I was like wow this sounds amazing so when I saw his name come up I said what's Skrillex doing with mm -hmm. Atmos wow mm -hmm. incredible the production is amazing it's not particularly my vibe of music that I'd sit down and listen to to, to, to sort of chill out but I can certainly appreciate it. it's amazing production uh, which sounded amazing in in uh, in atmos mm. yeah incredible it's, it is, it's making waves isn't it definitely the atmos thing is is coming through new to me as time, well so. and i'm really understanding what it does and funny enough flipping between atmos and stereo during the mastering process when you go to stereo it's like oh this sounds a little bit boring now <laughs> oh you know when it flops you know when you go back on the fours but it like give it five minutes and you don't listen to atmos and then you go back and listen to uh, stereo it's still pretty cool <laughs> Um, you've worked with some big names. Who are your musical heroes? You might not like their music as much. Okay, but as it's pretty, that's as a pretty individuals. easy. That's a pretty easy question, Tom. I think my biggest musical hero is probably Stevie Wonder. Okay, because his music, I think, is timeless. Mm -hmm. But also, just the being a classically trained musician and understanding about harmony what he does with records with his chords and structures are just mind-blowing mm -hmm. and i think that's what makes his music just feel so rich and clever and inspiring so and not even the fact that the guy's blind <laughs> the records that he's come out with are just they're still some of the only records on the planet that will move you almost to tears mm -hmm. there's a song called lately that he wrote and i listened to that song if i haven't heard it for a while and it's just like oh it just gets me mm -hmm. It's just amazing. It's, I don't know anybody that doesn't like Stevie's music anyway. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it just makes incredible. you smile. It makes you want to clap your hands, wants to dance, it but also feel, it? it just gives you the good fit vibes, you know. And uh, yeah, so it, I think he's definitely up there as a. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, I'm also a massive fan of the Foo Fighters. I think Dave Grohl is the most amazing guy. Uh, I love the Foo Fighters, and um, I, I've got a really eclectic mix. Uh, and I'm, I, you know, I'm happy listening to Stravinsky or yeah. Mahler or something, you know, at the same time. So, but yeah, I, like there's definitely a pedestal there, mm -hmm. Stevie. Stevie Wonder, that's yeah. the man. Interesting. Okay, cool. So, do you have any advice for young people that are looking to move into the professional audio industry? Yes. Um, and how about they would go doing that, and, and well, whatever advice you would have to give. Them. My advice would be, uh, don't give up because it seems like it's a huge mountain to climb. And I think that you look at 
places of these huge studios, you know, in the world and it's like you want to work there or you even just want to be able to record something and, you know, to be a work in audio. Don't give up. Just always think, no, I can do that because I really do believe whether I was lucky or not with the story I was telling about writing to Trevor, I think that could go a long way. If you feel passionate about somebody else's work in, in the field that you really want to get into, try and get in touch with them somehow. Try and just say, you know, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love, you know, and don't give up on that idea that you think that they're untouchable because they would probably want to be, want to help you uh, to get there, you know, and, and I think that's the biggest thing because I think a lot of young people starting out in this business just think that no, they'll never be able to do it. But that, on my honest advice is would don't, don't give up. My other piece of advice would be prepared to do anything. When I landed my job with Trevor Horn, I was happy to walk his dog, make the tea, make the coffee. You know, it's a classic thing about the tea part person at the, at the studios, you know, they make the tea and coffee or they're the runner. But you are in that establishment and you are going to witness other things being happen and you're going to learn studio etiquette, which is a huge thing about how to sort of conduct yourself amongst people. And I think that's a massive thing. Uh, so be prepared to do what it takes to work up the ladder, because I think this is one of the few industries that still has that sort of slightly hierarchical thing where you start off, yeah. you know, making the tea and then, you know, I remember at Psalm Studios, you'd come in and you'd be answering the telephones on night reception, it was called. And uh, you'd, you'd work from nine in the night till nine in the morning, you know. And then you'd move up to uh, working in the copy room, copying tapes. And then you'd go from that to making coffee on a session. But you're walking into a session where George Michael would have been or the Pet Shop Boys in my day. <laughs> God, I sound old. Uh, <laughs> and I think that that, you know, it's that idea about you're willing to do anything and, uh, and also, you know, get educated in it. Mm. You know, I think that's a really big thing. The Abbey Road Institute's a really cool, mm. a cool, There's cool lots place. Lots of opportunities that lots of studios across the UK, across the world that offer. Yeah, um, there's lots of places. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and I think that doing that and understanding how real studios work as well. Uh, the Tom Meister course at Kingston University. That's mm. a really, that's a really great course. That's I've got a, a lot, one, isn't it? massive, and I've got a lot of friends. You know, Andrew mm. went there. He studied there, and uh, and I think that being able to be educated in it uh, is 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 certainly sort of the ground level. Uh, but also, if you don't want to do that, and you're willing to work as an apprentice and sort of work your way up, then do that. But my biggest thing would be just don't give up, no matter how hard you think it is to be there. Because I think I truly believe if you want to do it, you will do it. Interesting. I, I really do. Okay. I really do. Yeah, yeah. I, if somebody had told me 25 years ago I was going to be working with Alan Menken <laughs> or Stephen Sondheim, yeah, yeah. or indeed landing a job with Trevor Horn, you'd just laugh. But I think you really can actually go, no, I want to do that with my life. I want to get to that point where I am working with these superstars. Uh, because I think one thing I would say is working in audio can be a really lonely business. You work in rooms a lot on your own. And I think one thing that I've realized I've got older is I love collaboration because there's somebody always there looking over your shoulder and go, is that any good what I've just done? Because it's really hard, you know, why is it up to me just to say that's the right thing to do? It's really nice to be able to bounce stuff off. And I think moving from making records in the 90s to working on films, the one thing you have to work as is a, is a team and you really are a big cog in a, in a clock. And it's so nice to sit down with somebody and go, is that, is that okay? And, and, on, and on films, you've got the director or you've got the, the film producer, but generally the director is who I'm working for. And you collaborate. It is a collaboration because the director doesn't know everything about everything. Mm. They can't be experts in every field of filmmaking. And I think that's one really interesting thing is that, and, and I really do mean this in a serious way, is that when you doubt yourself, because everybody does when you're making something, what's to say that is the, the good or the bad? That's just my decision on that day. But I think collaboration and working in a team and learning to just interact with people. I think that's a really good skill to learn as well, because I think that as, you, as, as time moves on and, and, and studios become more of a, um, 
you know, there's lots of studios there. There's little production rooms where people work on their own. Come out of the production room if you work on your own and come and talk to somebody else. Swap ideas, talk about stuff because it can be, you know, you don't want it to feel like an insular process because I think sharing, that's what I learned when I started to play a, an instrument is when you come to share your music is when you realise how amazing it is. It's, yeah, making music can be... Making real. music is a real thing that when you start to play with, whether it be one person or 50 other people in an orchestra, mm -hmm. it's the most amazing experience because you're sharing a, a I common... I'm just thinking about doing it. A <laughs> common know, love. It every week. So. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. A, it's a common love. And, uh, and, and I never take it for granted when you're in front of a symphony orchestra and you're producing a, an orchestra and you're, you're sort of... Is this sound really coming from behind that glass screen? Because, and it constantly amazes me and the way that you can manipulate it. But we're all, we're all as one. There's nobody who's better than anybody That's else. Yeah. And we're all, it's all a, just a massive team effort. So I think somebody who wants to get into the, the world of audio or production is, is learning to be a, a, a massive team player and just leave your ego at the door. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's yeah. such a great, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's such a great Absolutely. advice that I've also been, you know, if you come in with a big ego, uh, then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't become a sort of universal thing together it just all becomes about you and that's not always a good thing interesting okay fantastic well thank you very much mike um, thanks tom that was a pleasure been a, yeah been a fantastic i time. hope some of my ramblings are hopeful yeah. useful to anybody absolutely i'm sure they will be <laughs> I have no doubt about that okay so, certainly if nobody else listens to it it's great for me oh so. okay cool cool <laughs>